everyone, this is Kelly Walmsley and welcome to the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. So this officially is my first um, podcast with um, a non-host. And so I'm really excited because the person that I'm interviewing is somebody who is a great friend, um, colleague, and also mentor of mine, Dr. Joe Moritz. Um, so welcome, Joe. Hi, Kelly. I'm very happy to be here. I'm I'm so excited to have you on the show. And so um, I'm just I'm going to start out every podcast or try to with the, just a couple of little fun things back and forth. Um, so it's so rapid fire. So just bear with me and, you know, go with your gut. OK, so uh, fried or grilled chicken. Grilled. Dog or cat. Dog. Bigfoot or Yeti. Bigfoot. Flat or drumette. I like drumettes. I agree. Good choice. <laughs> okay. Now, also, if you were in a zombie apocalypse, what poultry nutritionist, who would you take with you? Um, definitely Angela Lamp from Michael Foods because uh, she's tough and she uh, sometimes can be very angry. And that would be a good quality. Yeah, I agree. I, she's an excellent choice. <laughs> I love it. Ready for more sustainable poultry production? New data suggests that decreasing bacterial loads in feed using Termin 8 supports entric health, leading to improved performance. Gut health is more than a gut instinct. Learn more today at www.anatox.com. I'm really excited because today we're going to um, discuss a paper that just came out of your lab that I had a little bit of part on also that came out in Journal of Applied Poultry Research in the current issue. And so um, I think it's going to be linked in for um, our viewers or readers to be able to, or listeners to be able to access, but it's called Hygienic Pelleting Can Decrease Hubbard by Ross 708, a Perioleal Amino Acid Digestibility, Broiler Performance, and Increase Digestible Amino Acid Requirements. Um, so really uh, interesting paper. Um, first, it's in the title. Let's talk about what a hygienizer is, Joe. Sure. Uh, so a hygienizer looks very similar to a conditioner. It's a long cylinder, just like a conditioner would be, uh, and it's placed in line after the conditioner. And instead of having internal paddles and direct steam injection, a hygienizer has a very slow turning conveyance system. It's kind of a slow turning screw and jacketed heat, so you don't get any direct steam injection. And the overall idea of a hygienizer is to maintain the temperature that's created in the conditioner and just to maintain that temperature for a prolonged period of time. Yeah, great. Um, and so, you know, you're talking about feed mill equipment, but you're really, you're a poultry nutritionist with some feed mill training, um, right, and the expertise. So um, maybe just to out there to those people who are like, okay, why are we covering feed mill equipment first? Yeah, have a comment for that? So I, I think it's essential to understand the paper. You need to know what, what a hygienizer is because that's that's not standard equipment. That's kind of a newer technology, at, at least in the U.S. Yeah, okay. So the biggest impact um, on your paper um, and from the, the paper, what, what would you say would be the biggest impact um, for people to understand? Sure. So, so I think there's few studies on hygienic pelleting in general, and there's even fewer on hygienic pelleting linked to nutrition. So, so having some type of data set is very important. Um, if a company would use hygienic pelleting to feed birds such as breeders or pedigree poultry, then I think it's assumed that there, there's going to be nutrient detriment. But this study actually quantifies that, that detriment. So, uh, the study demonstrates in multiple analyses that there's a need to increase amino acid density by about 10% in order to maintain performance equivalent to what would be uh, seen with standard pellet. And I think it's important to be able to quantify a nutritional trade-off for producing hygienic feed. And, and that's the real goal why you're using a hygienizer is to create hygienic feed. Uh, but, but that would be the, the kind of worst case scenario of what happens with nutrition. Yeah, I think that's a great point because you really are looking at it from all the different angles. And as you know, touched upon in the title, you're looking from a parent ileal amino acid digestibility standpoint. I'm trying to estimate the digestible lysine requirement of the birds that are fed these different treatment, these uh, feeds that are processed in different manners. And so for the people out there, so 
Hygienic pelleting decreased digestible lysine requirement by 10%. So for the person out there thinking this doesn't apply to them because they don't use a hygienizer and they're not thinking about using a hygienizer, what would you say to them? But, well, I think this paper sets a, a certain precedent. So um, hygienic pelleting represents kind of an upper thermal processing extreme. So these diets were uh, conditioned at 190 degrees Fahrenheit um, for 60 seconds and then held in the hygienizer for six minutes. So it's it's kind of up there. Um, but there's other publications that show conditioning at high temperatures for extended time, just standard conditioning, are also detrimental to nutrition. So some folks that may be chasing improved pellet quality and, and they chase it by increasing thermal processing, such as high steam conditioning temperature and extended conditioning times. Um, but, but I think before those strategies are implemented, it's important to consider things such as nutrient detriment and specifically maybe enzyme stability if the enzymes are added at the mixer and then also amino acid digestibility. Add great point. Elevate bird well-being and improve profitability with Cargill's tailored nutrient solutions that deliver performance. Cargill is leading through applied nutrition, leveraging deep nutrient insights and understanding of the animal's nutrient requirements to achieve your production and performance goals. So, you know, one one area that we're kind of going into is a uh, lower crude protein diet formulation. Um, and often that's for NAM or crystalline amino acids. And so what do you think about, I mean, what would you say? I know that's not something that was in the scope of this paper, but from maybe applying a diet such as that um, in in manufacturing in the same manner, do you think that um, you would have different results or similar results or what would you infer? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So in, in our current paper, we used corn soy diets uh, with just crystalline methionine, lysine, and threonine. And our basal diet crude protein was somewhere around 23%. So I, I think there was plenty of protein substrate to undergo some some transition, tertiary and secondary shifts in structure that would uh, subsequently affect amino acid digestibility. So if you were to formulate a lower crude protein diet with more synthetics, um, perhaps it would be less reactive uh, unless you're using other ingredients. So if, if you had some additional ingredients such as uh, ingredients with increased reducing sugars like a bakery byproduct meal, then that would actually uh, increase Mayard reactions. So I, I think as long as you stick with corn, soy, low crude protein, you, you would probably have less detriment. But if you added something with reducing sugars, uh, you could have similar or more detriment. Okay. So what recommendations overall do you have for researchers, feed manufacturers, nutritionists um, about assays, um, either in the feed or in the bird um, and looking at the response of the bird, if they're concerned about hurting digestibility of um, the diets that they're formulating or manufacturing. So, so I know that's of interest to a lot of people and we're always interested in analytics to predict what, what would happen in the bird. Um, but I'm a believer in observing what the bird is telling us. Uh, I've done multiple studies where in vitro activities and assays, they don't really line up with performance and digestibility. So I really think performance and digestibility data are, are superior, at least right now, to predictive assays. You know, we can look at reactive lysine, we can look at in vitro available lysine, uh, but that doesn't always line up with with digestible uh, lysine when, you, when you're looking at chick assays. Okay. So what's next? Uh, where do we need to go next in the research? Where do you plan to go? If you can give us a little bit of a snippet into that. Um, so it, I, I like this paper. I hope people read the paper. I think it's an easy read. Um, and I think there's, it's important to have continued focus on microbial pathogen control with feed manufacture. Uh, this study was very general and it answered an important question concerning the downside of hygienic pelleting, but I think it's important to continue to flesh out the positive attributes of hygienic pelleting. Uh, that type of research is, is certainly complex. And some of those complexities include things like choosing an appropriate uh, surrogate organism uh, try not to contaminate your feed mill. And then I think it would be great to be able to follow organisms uh, throughout the mill and then throughout trucking, throughout the farm, and, and even tracking those organisms through the bird. Um, but regardless uh, to the complexity, I think it's an important area of research. Okay, so Joe, what do you think about the current economic environment? So um, fluctuating diet costs, energy costs, um, do they warrant us pelleting in the same way? 
So, so we started this study about three years ago, and certainly things change. I think there there will always be volatility in, in production variables, but the f- the thought process should should be the same. Uh, you consider costs and risks. So, for example, if salmonella represents a significant risk, then cost for pelleting and perhaps hygienic pelleting uh, may be appropriate. So, perhaps the cost is justifiable for breeders or pedigree poultry, uh, but not typical broilers and, and turkeys. Gotcha. Thank you so much for joining us today, Joe. Uh, it's always a pleasure to catch up a little bit and talk science and, and get to see you. Um, I've got one last question. Um, since we are on the poultry nutrition black belt, Jackie Chan or Chuck Norris? Uh, Chuck Norris. I agree. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us today and listening in. Um, to the poultry nutrition black belt Uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next episode hey everyone we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week and if you have a poultry nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it and share it with us feel free to email the research link uh, the paper where we can find it or the abstract to hello at wisenetics.com that's hello at wisenetics.com and look forward to hearing from you